I'm Matt Harris, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. An underappreciated story with the removal of the priesthood ban considers the Brazil temple. In our next conversation with Dr. Matt Harris, we'll talk about why that temple was so important and how it helped change apostles' attitudes towards the priesthood ban. Check out our conversation. Well, that's very interesting because, and I I know we talked about this last time, but I'd like to revisit a little bit because it's very related there. Um, You know, when we had the 1978 revelation, um, I I know that you had mentioned, was it, Marky Peterson had had a problem with that and made made a deal. Can, Can you tell us a little bit more about that story? Yeah, so maybe maybe I should back up a little bit. Okay. So if I can put put some context to it. So it's been I think um, I'm going to just speak bluntly. I think the church hasn't done a very good job telling the priesthood revelation story. You read manuals, and all of a sudden President Kimball shows up with the twelve in the temple and has a revelation, and all worthy male members can go to the priesthood and or hold the priesthood and go to the temple. That is just such a mischaracterization, what goes on. It's not spontaneous. This has been going on for a long time, right? This is weighing on President Kimball's mind. And he writes his son a letter in 1963, and he calls the priesthood ban a possible error, quote, unquote, a possible error. So he clearly has issues with it as early as 1963. And in 1969, he supports Hubie Brown, President Brown, who was in the first presidency, he supports um, Brown, Brown's overture to give ordained black men to the priesthood. And Brown thinks it's a policy that can be changed by administrative fiat. He doesn't think it's a revelation like some of the Brethren of the Twelve. So if it's a policy, it can be changed like that. Whereas Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold Lee, if it's a revelation, then it's got to be changed by revelation. So there's some differences in how they approach it. Well, anyway, President Brown um, had convinced members of the 12 to support the end of the ban. And Spencer Kimball was one of them. So in the fall of 1969, Spencer W. Kimball, who's then a senior apostle, agrees to give black men the priesthood. I think you have to understand that when you understand his presidency. So what I uh, would argue is from my research, and uh, and I've, I've shared this with his son, the late, great Ed Kimball, who's a wonderful human being just passed away, I guess, a few years ago. Anyway, so I share this with him. I, I said, um, and his father, or Ed Kimball, has written um, a lovely book on his father's presidency. Length in Your Stride is awesome. Yeah, it's, I think it's one of the best. And I got the one from Benchmark or, that uh-huh. has the, all the extra information. Oh, nice. I have that one, too. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the, the Desert Book publication that's, that's the predecessor to Benchmark. That is, I think, one of the finest biographies that Desert Book has published. But anyway, um, so I ran my, so he facilitated access to his father's papers for me. So I, I, I just got to see those papers and my admiration for his father just grew exponentially going through his papers. And anyway, um, so when I um, met with Ed Kimball one long afternoon, we had dinner and we talked and, and I said, I want to share a thesis with you about your father that you didn't write about in your book. And the thesis is this. He's an academic, so he knows what a thesis is. I said, your father wanted to lift the priesthood ban the minute he became the church president. And he looked at me, his eyes got really big, and he said, you're right. And I said, he said, I wasn't at liberty to write that. And I said, well, I am. (laughs) And anyway, so I shared some of my ideas with him that the um, Brazil temple was one of the ways that he would do that. I mean, think about how ironic it is to announce the building of a temple in a nation that's like 85% biracial. Nobody can go to the temple, right? How crazy is that? And President Kimball had been to Brazil um, in the 1950s, so he knew ex- he, as he had apostolic administrative oversight over Brazil. I think President McKay wanted him in Brazil. so. Anyway, so he'd been to Brazil. He knew the challenges of the priesthood ban there. So he's very familiar with the people in the country. And so they announce a temple where no one can worship. (laughs) And the irony of it is, of course, there's lots of great stories told about this, Mark Grover and others, that the sacrifice of the saints to build this temple when none of them are going to be able to 
participate, or a few of them will be able to participate. So anyway, with all of that, uh, President, that's one of the first things that he does is announces the, the um, in his presidency, he announces the building of this temple. And the upshot of this story, there's a lot going on here, but I'll just simplify it. The upshot of the story is he uses the temple to get some of the doctrinal hardliners to fall into line. Realize, hey, we have a problem. We can't lengthen our stride. We can't share the gospel message. We can't move the, the church into every kindred nation, tongue, and people if we're blocked by this barrier, this ban. How do we do this? And they had tried earlier in the 60s to move into some African countries and realized it was a disaster. You can't have white people coming from Salt Lake in a missionary capacity to run a congregation when these good African saints think that they're fully capable of doing it themselves. So they, they tried it and it just didn't work. So anyway, um, President Kimball, this is a huge impediment to his gospel vision to universalize the gospel message. It's his ban. So he pushes the Brazil temple through and he uh, recognizes he has a problem though, that he has some hardliners in the 12 that he has to overcome. And Harold Lee and Joseph Fielding Smith, bless them, but they're gone by now. They were the previous hardliners. Well, Bruce McConkie is the biggest hardliner that he has now, and Mark Peterson, to be honest. And um, anyway, so Elder uh, President Kimball is a masterful manager of people. It's, I guess, to, uh, in, the, in the university setting where I work and where if you study organizational behavior, this is a classic case of organizational behavior, how to deal with people, how to get them over to your position. And so President Kimball uh, brings them in over a period of several weeks, some of the hardliners, and consults with them and counsels with them. And we've got a problem in Brazil, Elder McConkie. You know that we have a new temple here. What do we do? Now, this is the funny part. President Kimball knows what needs to be done, but he can't do it without getting buy-in from the most vociferous member of the 12 and the most vociferous apostle opposing the ban, at least at that time. Right? Mormon doctrine, of course, he articulates his views about the ban in, in African Americans or persons of African descent. So anyway, he has to convince Elder McConkie this is the right thing to do. And Elder McConkie, um, Elder McConkie will be persuaded that if they're, the saints were to, to utilize the Brazil temple, they have to give black men the priesthood. That's the short answer. And if you read Elder McConkie's son's memoir, Joseph Philly McConkie writes a book about his father in 2003. And you read the chapter in the Priesthood Revelation. It's um, Joseph Fielding McConkie gives the credit to his father. It was my father's idea to give blacks the priesthood. At least that's how I read it. And the Brazil temple. And, and I'm thinking, I, I actually chuckled when I read that, that chapter because President Kimball knew darn well what he was doing. And Elder McConkie didn't know what was going on. But President McConkie, or President... Um, uh, Kimball had to persuade him that this is the right thing to do. And I'll just uh, say one, one other thing about Elder McConkie before I get to Elder Peterson is that Elder McConkie had been visiting Brazil for several weeks and months prior to the revelation. He wanted to see, to meet with the Brazilian saints, if they have the leadership capacity, I need to know these people better. And anyway, um, he did that at President Kimball's urging. Get to know those people, go visit them. And so I'm told by a mission president and his wife that Elder McConkie was one of the most frequent apostle visitors in the weeks and days leading up to the revelation. All the, all the, the entire 12 came through, but Elder McConkie came more than anybody else. That's a really interesting story. So President Kimball uses the Brazil temple to get uh, Elder McConkie to fall into line. And with Elder Peterson, um, some of your listeners may not know this, some may, I suppose, but there were 10 apostles present in the temple in June of 1978. The two who were missing, Elder Stapley, was in a hospital bed in Salt Lake, and he dies in August of 1978. So he clearly is on the, the downhill slide. And then Elder Peterson's in South America. And this is my opinion, but it wasn't uh, no coincidence that President Kimball chose the time to go to the temple and to pray with the apostles when Elder Peterson was out of the country because he was a, he just didn't support giving black men the priesthood. And so what happens is, is that after the revelation occurs and the apostles, each of them to a T will later express their feelings about it. Most, some of them will say it's the most intense spiritual experience of their lives. And 
Um, anyway, they, the first presidency visits with Elder Stapley in his hospital bed, and they tell him what had just happened. And he gives his assent to the revelation. And then they call Elder Peterson, who was in South America. He was staying at the home of a general authority in Brazil who was there um, named Grant Bangader, Elder Bangader, who was a mission president there and also a missionary. So Elder Bangader had uh, extensive ties to Brazil. Anyway, um, so President Kimball calls up Elder Peterson, and I'll just summarize uh, this, that he says that we had a revelation, we're going to give black men the priesthood. And Elder Peterson says, is that so? And um, President Kimball says, yes, that's true. Well, did the brethren all agree to it? Yes. Well, I suppose I won't stand in the way then. That was the, the general tenor of it. And what's interesting <laughs> is that if you read his daughter's biography of her father, it's published in 1985, and it says something like, you know, he's an enth he was an enthusiastic supporter of the revelation. <laughs> We're talking about Peterson. This is Peterson. His daughter writes this in her book that her father was an enthusiastic supporter of the revelation. And that, that's a little bit overstated. He was not an enthusiastic supporter. In fact, I'm... Um, in, um, when the revelation was published in the Deseret News, Elder Peterson insisted that there was a, that there was a full blown ad, if you look at the paper. So the, the official manifesto number two was right there in the, in the paper, big, pretty big, whatever, eight by 11, whatever Above it was. the fold. Above the fold, yeah. And he insisted on the adjacent fold, they had some quotes from President Kimball and other general authorities where it says that interracial marriage is discouraged. And that was at Elder Peterson's insistence that that be put next to it. And what's interesting about that is, is that some of the black saints, black Latter-day Saints, who saw that, they were thoroughly confused by this interracial marriage, uh, sta these statements from the past statements from leaders. And the reason why they were uh, flummoxed by it is because they thought, well, we understood why you couldn't, why we weren't supposed to marry um, interracially before the revelation because our offspring, we couldn't go to the temple and all of that. But now that we can go to the temple, what's the problem? And moreover, they were really upset because there were not a lot of black saints in the church, right? You're supposed to, this is President Kimball, all we, you know, Mormons should marry Mormons and Catholics should marry Catholics and Koreans should marry Koreans and blacks should marry blacks. It wasn't just blacks and whites for marrying. It really, you, you marry across your economic boundary, your racial boundary, and your religious boundary. And this is President Kimball from the 1950s. He was reading prescriptive marital literature, and that's what it taught at the time, right? So he wasn't, you know, creating this himself. He was really steeped in that marital prescriptive literature from the 40s and 50s, where you, you know, Catholics married Catholics and middle class married middle class. Anyway, um, so these black saints, are, they look at this interracial disclaimer and they're flummoxed. Why can't we marry who we love, right? And by this point, there are some uh, black students at BYU and they're engaged to be married to white students. And they're, they're consulting with their bishops and their stake presidents, and they're getting told, no, don't do it. There's not a lot of black people to marry at BYU. No. <laughs> Still. No. So they want to, black Mormons should marry black Mormons. That's what they're told. But there are no black Latter-day Saints, at least that they thought that they could marry. So anyway, uh, just to end this uh, thought here, is that uh, I'm thinking of one instance. I'll leave the names out. But they counseled with a couple of apostles and including Elder Packer, no, don't do that, don't marry. You can do more for your life by not marrying this white guy who's talking to a black sister. Anyway, this black sister went to President Kimball and he hugged her and said, it's not against, we, he said, it's true we counsel from um, blacks and whites for marrying, but it's not against the Lord's will. You have my blessing if you do that. And so this woman, this black woman, a BYU student married her, um, her fiance and with President Kimball's blessing. So, but it was, there was so much um, uh, contention with, with interracial things, even after the revelation occurred, people were uneasy about it. Well, yeah, I mean, because you know, we, we started talking a little bit about this Bob Jones uh, issue with, with interracial marriage. And I think there has been a lot of confusion over the years. I mean, even as recently as a few years ago, that President Kimball quote was in, I know it was in the Ironic Priesthood Manual, I don't, I, and I don't know if it still is, but... It's been removed, I Has believe. it been removed? I think so. Okay. Yeah. So, but this has just been within the last three or four years, I think, that it's been removed. So there's a lot of question about, is it okay, is, intermesh, is interracial marriage okay? 
And it seems like Kimball was okay with it, but w was he unfairly stained with, with Peterson's insistence that this appear alongside the revelation in 1978? You know, I don't know his response to that. Clearly it got in, and clearly he was a church president and could have kept it from going in. But, you know, sometimes if you know how church, the church hierarchy works, it's a funny thing. Sometimes um, the president's on the, in, in on the, the no, and sometimes he's not. And he's a busy guy. They don't burden him with everything. But Elder Peterson had connections to the newspaper because that's what he worked in before he was a member of the 12. And I don't, I don't know. I'd be speculating. But I don't know how it got in, although I know that he insisted that it be in. Peterson. Peterson, yeah. But I will tell you this, that the, um, some of the early brethren... If I had to guess, most of them were, the vast majority of them were still against interracial marriage, including President Kimball. The difference is, is the rigidity. President Kimball thought that it wasn't a sin. We discourage it, but if, you, if you're going to marry, you know, you have my blessing if you love him and you feel it's right. And you, you know, you go to the temple and you can do it. But Elder Packer went to his dying day thinking that, you know, blacks and whites shouldn't marry. And I know there's some other brethren like that. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Matt Harris. If you can't wait to hear more and you don't want to wait for our next episode, please remember that we've already talked to Matt previously um, and we've talked a little bit about biracial families in Brazil, as well as the more of the role that the Brazil Temple played in removing the priesthood ban. So check out our other conversation with Dr. Matt Harris and you can also get a transcript if you'd like to see the whole thing. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about BYU. How do religious minorities and racial minorities fit in at BYU? But there's also um, this idea, it's still a white student body. And there are some black kids who go to BYU and the truth is it's a mixed bag. I know some black students who've gone there and they fit in really well and been happy and some have just been miserable. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview and you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button of course we're also on Facebook Twitter and all the other places uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.